Good morning, Redeemer Church. It's a joy to be with you today to uh, speak to you from 2 Corinthians chapter 5, so I'm glad you're already turned there. Uh, you know, just a few years ago, I was in uh, New Delhi, India, and had the opportunity to meet someone who worked in the embassy uh, from the United States, U.S. Embassy in India. And as we chatted, um, I was just asking, what's it like to be a part of the ambassador's office here in New Delhi? And uh, one, of the, one of the curious things as we talked is, he said, you know, I never stop working for the em- embassy. While I'm here, when, if I'm drinking coffee in the morning before I get to work or after, you know, work is done, I, I go home or I go out with friends and have a meal, I, I still remain associated with as a part of the embassy of the United States of America. I I still represent the United States of America as a part of uh, the embassy and the diplomatic mission there. And the thing that was curious to me as I, or struck me as, as we were chatting is I thought this guy had crystal clear uh, thoughts and and ideas about his identity. He knew who he was in the country of India. He was an official representative an official spokesperson for his country. Well, today, we're going to look at a passage that talks about a crystal clear identity for the Christian. Because God, if you're a Christian, has reconciled you to himself and at the very same time given you, entrusted into your hands, a ministry of reconciliation. He has given you an appeal because he is appealing through you to the world. And so we call the world to repent because God is calling the world to repent. My hope this morning is that you, uh, you Christian, you, your family, your community, your community group would have such a, a crystal clear identity of, of who you are in God's kingdom that you can speak this message of the reconciliation that Jesus Christ provides for the world. Now look back at 2 Corinthians 5. I'll read the passage and let's open up in a word of prayer. The Apostle Paul writes in verse 18, all this is from God who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them and entrusting to us this message of reconciliation. Therefore, We are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Pray with me. Father in heaven, we come to you now. We ask, I ask right now that you would shine light on this passage, shine light on Jesus Christ. Spirit of God, open up our eyes so that we may behold Jesus. Oh Lord, for those of us who know him and love him, Lord, help us to rejoice, to think so deeply and broadly about all that Jesus has accomplished on our behalf, or that our hearts are filled with joy and delight. Lord, for those who do not know him, who who do not follow him, Lord, I pray that you would open their eyes that they may see the goodness and the glory and the forgiveness that only Jesus offers them. Spirit of God, help me to speak your word. In the name of Jesus, amen. We'll see four aspects of reconciliation from this passage. We'll see that God initiates reconciliation for the world. We'll see that The world requires reconciliation. We'll see that Jesus accomplishes that reconciliation and that we who follow Christ are actually ambassadors of that reconciliation. We speak about it to the world. And so consider with me how God initiates or or starts and has planned and implemented this reconciliation. Look there at verse 18. Those words he says, all this is from God. All this is from, oh, what is from God? You know, to really understand this, this passage of reconciliation, we gotta back up a little bit because, you see, Paul loved this church in Corinth. He had planted this church several years previous and he, he loved them, they were in his heart and he actually corresponded, wrote several letters and received letters from them. He cared about them and for them. In fact, many disciples, many people had been made disciples in, the, in that city of Corinth. Uh, People who came from very moral backgrounds, people who were really proud and into philosophy and and high society, people who were idolaters, all kinds of people. 
had turned to the Lord Jesus Christ and become disciples. And they were gathering together, fellowshipping around the word and around prayer, around the Lord's table. And they, and they loved each other. And yet, into that group, there were also some who had, who had snuck in. People who, who didn't love the gospel. And they, they actually attacked Paul and his, his apostolic authority. They attacked Paul's um, ministry and they also attacked and undermined the gospel. And so Paul wrote this book, 2 Corinthians, to ground the church in his apostolic authority and to ground the church in the gospel. He wanted them to know how does a faithful church live in the world? How does, what does a faithful church love in the world? And so he wrote them this letter to call them to come back to him, to, to the gospel and to his ministry as an apostle. And that's where we, we can pick up this, even this passage today in chapter five. Look at verse 16. Chapter five, verse 16. Paul says, from now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh. According to the flesh. Just means according to human ideas, a worldly way. You know, those, those people that were attacking Paul, one of the things they criticized Paul of was how he looked, like actually how he spoke. They, they made fun of the way that the Apostle Paul taught. And so while they were making fun of him, they were, they were speaking in a worldly, fleshly way. Paul says, we don't regard people like that anymore. Look back at verse 16. Even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh, we regard him thus no longer. Paul says that we who are in Christ, we used to regard or think about Jesus Christ even in a worldly or fleshly way. Some of us, maybe even here today, used to think that Jesus Christ was weak, lacked wisdom. Uh, maybe you thought that he was merely a prophet. You didn't understand who he was, but now in Christ, we understand who he is. He's king of kings. He's Lord of lords. Yes, a prophet, but more than a prophet. King of kings and our savior. And today, if you're a Christian, if you follow him, you know who he is. And yet, how's that possible? But well, here we see the next verse 17. Paul says, if therefore anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. Paul shows us that you who are in Christ are, are, have been changed. You've been transformed. You're not the same as you were before because God has changed you. He's transformed you. You're a new creation in Jesus Christ. All this is from God. God is the one who's transformed you and changed you if you're in Christ and trust him. He's the one that's made you a new creation. And this is why today as you sit here, if you follow Christ, you no longer regard him according to the flesh. You know who he is and you love him because God has initiated this plan of reconciliation. He started this long ago and he, he implemented it at just the right time. Time. He sent Jesus Christ. We, we read about that in Galatians chapter 4. Galatians 4 4 says, At When the fullness of time had come, it's just the right time, God the Father sent forth Jesus, born of woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law so that we might be adopted as sons. You know, this was his plan that he would, that he would send Jesus Christ and save his people. And beloved, today, if you know him, you've been reconciled to him, even as we sang and even as we read. And yet, what is reconciliation? Kind of a big word, right? Said it a whole bunch of times. It comes up five times in this passage. What is reconciliation? Simply put, reconciliation is, is an enemy who becomes a friend. An enemy become friend. Reconciliation. Those of us who were far off are now brought Near. Reconciliation, an enemy become a friend. And really to get at what reconciliation is, we have to back up a little bit. Because the world requires reconciliation. The, the world needs to be reconciled to God because at a very basic level, the world is separated from God. Every single human being, every, in every single culture, speaking every kind of language, is, is separated from God from birth. We do not know him as we ought. All of us, all of us 
have turned each his own way. We are like sheep who have gone astray, Isaiah 53. We have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, far short of his honor and his splendor, of his character, of his goodness, of his holiness. You know, most people in the world know that something is wrong. Even if you're, you're here today and you're not a Christian, you know that something is wrong in the world. You might even ask, why is the world so broken? It, 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 it just, it's, un, it's unjust. Perhaps today you can think even in your own mind. You think, why am I so disheartened? Why can't I get it together? Why am I so unhappy? You see, we, we know that something is wrong, but we don't always know what is wrong. We, we know that something is wrong, but we don't always know why something is wrong, why we're broken. Several years ago, I visited Allahabad, India in the north when, when the Mahaku Mela was happening. We lived just a couple hours away and a friend and I drove there to chat with people. You see, it's, it's the gathering of the, world, the world's largest gathering of humanity. That month that we were there, 45 million people went to Allahabad to bathe in the rivers. And so we, we walked around and talked to people and tried to pray with people. And we would ask them, who have you come here with? And, and what are you doing here? And why have you come? And people would talk, well, we're going down to the river to bathe. Why? If I bathe in the river, people would say, all of my impurities will be washed away. Well, we would ask them, where did this impurity come from? They'd say, I don't know. I remember one man, Nitin. Hey, Nitin, where does the impurity go when you bathe in the water? He's like, I don't know. I guess into the water. How does the water cleanse you of your impurity? I don't know. Where was the impurity? Like in your hands? And he said, I don't know. He knew that something was wrong enough to travel all this way in pilgrimage to go to the river, but he didn't know what, and he didn't know why, and he didn't know how to get rid of it. So many of us are like that. We know that something is broken in the world. But we don't know exactly what. Scripture teaches us, though, what's broken, right? Look back at verse 19. Right there in the middle, Paul writes, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them. Trespass, sin, the, the transgression of God's law, the, the shame that we experience when we are separated from him, the defilement that we experience when we don't live according to, to his word. We are separated by our idolatry from God, by our rebellion, by our pride. In fact, we, we, are, we are far from God if we think about it practically. I mean, it reminds me, my son, Ethan, he's five. The other day he told me, Daddy, I, I'm gonna be an airplane. And so he put his hands out and then he made a, a jet sound and then he jumped. Gonna be an airplane, Daddy. And then he jumped. And you know what he did? He flew about five inches. And of course, I had a little fun with him. I goaded him. I said, Oh, you know, Ethan, you, you need to get a running start. You need to sound a little louder for your jets to work. And so you know what he did? He, he got a running start. He ran to the back of the room. He ran as fast as he could. And then he sprung up into the air, arms out, and he made a huge jet sound. And he got about seven inches off the ground. I mean, a little boy trying to be a jet plane, it, it falls hopelessly short of what a jet plane really is, right? But you and I, you and I, trying to be holy, trying to accomplish all the good that God is like trying to experience his honor, we fall hope impossibly short of that glory, of that honor, of that splendor. You know, people are not separated from God because of their ethnicity, their, their education, their economic status. They're not separated because of their gender. They're not separated because of any external cultural thing. But, but as we saw, because of their trespasses, because of their sin, because of their, their shame. And you know, the result of this separation from God is terrible. It's frightening. It's why we see Paul in this passage pleading with people. You ever plead, you ever plead with somebody? Where you're saying, don't do it. Don't jump off the cliff. Don't eat that very strange thing you're about to eat. You know, we, we urge people over maybe minor things or human things. Here, Paul is pleading with people over eternal realities. We read in 2 Thessalonians 1.7, listen to this. 
When the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, inflicting vengeance on those who do not know God, on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus, they will suffer the punishment of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord, away from the glory of his might. This is why, friends, Redeemer Church preaches the gospel to everybody, to all kinds of people, as often as we can, because we want people to hear of the redemption, the, the reconciliation that they can experience in Jesus Christ. Because there is an eternal destiny, an eternal fate that awaits those who do not know him. You know, Jesus Christ himself, according to Matthew 25, he said that if you, if you don't know, if you don't follow him, he will say to you, depart from me, cursed, into the eternal fire reserved for the, for the devil and his angels. That's his word to those who have not yet turned to him. And so Paul shows us here that we're, we plead with people because sin, the separation that we have from God, it, the, the results of this are terrible and that they're weighty. We're, we're alienated from him, you and I, people by birth. And the world is separated from, doesn't, doesn't, doesn't experience peace with God as we ought because of our sin. You know, what is reconciliation? Do you remember? It's enemies become, are you with me? It's enemies become friends. You and I, beloved, we're by birth, we're enemies of God. And yet in reconciliation, God makes us a part of his family. He, he brings us into him very, his own self, into, into his life and makes us his friends. He welcomes us in reconciliation. But how? How can we have this peace with God? How can you have this peace with God? You know, many people here in Dubai, maybe not just here in Dubai, but especially in Dubai, think that they can earn or merit this kind of peace. You know, if they, if they just maybe earn enough, if they, if they give enough, if they, they ring enough bells, if they do enough prayers, maybe they'll be able to get closer to God. Maybe God will have mercy on them. Some people think, you know, maybe if I get, get like halfway, maybe God will come down halfway. You know, God helps those who help themselves. People will say, you know, many Christians even get messed up in the head with this. How can you have peace with God? There's not enough money you can give. There are enough, not enough prayers you can pray, not enough bells to ring, not enough. You cannot do enough to get close. You, you'll be just like my son trying to be a jet plane. You're going to get five inches and then fall back down because we are stained with sin. We are weighed down by our trespasses. I wonder today, if you're not a follower of Jesus Christ, what do you do with your sin? What do you do with your shame? How will you wash away your defilement? Today in this passage, we see that you need a savior. I need a savior. And in fact, what we see in this passage is that Jesus is that savior. We see that Jesus accomplishes reconciliation. If the Father initiated it because the world requires it, Jesus accomplishes it there. Look there at verse 18. And let's go on beyond. He says, all this is from God who through Christ reconciled us to himself. Look at verse 19. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them. Jesus reconciles to God all who trust in him. He undertakes and achieves it. He brings it about. We see that only in Jesus, in his sinless life, in his sacrificial death, in his victorious resurrection, that he saves us from our sin. It is through him that our sins are not accounted to us or against us. It is through him and in him that we are brought near to God, brought back to God. We are reconciled to God in and through Jesus. And so all of my 
sin and shame. All of your idolatry and your pride, all of our rebellion and our anger and our impatience and our lust and our envy and our fear can be forgiven in Jesus Christ and through Jesus Christ. And I want to ask again, how can this be? How can we have this peace with God given everything that we've done, everything that we are? How can we be brought back to God? Remember that like the guy in Allahabad, at the Kumela, he doesn't know what the, what the river does, what's the mechanism, how does it cleanse him? How does Jesus accomplish this peace for us? How can we enter into this? How can we be reconciled to God? Look at verse 21. Paul writes, for our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Did you see? Because God counted all against Jesus, God counted against Jesus all, all of that pride, all, all of that anger, all of that envy, that fear, that lust, all of that impatience. God counted against Jesus, so he doesn't account it against us. And in this we see what we might call the great exchange. Jesus takes from us our shame and gives us his honor as the beloved son. He takes from us our defilement, our impurities, and he gives us his unconquerable holiness. He takes from us our guilt and he gives to us his holiness, his innocence. In this we, we might Remember the words of Martin Luther, he, called, he says that Jesus on the cross became the maximal sinner and we become holy. Colossians 1.19, for in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. Or listen to Romans chapter 5. God shows, demonstrates his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since therefore we've been justified, that is declared right, we have peace with God. Much more shall we be saved from him or by him from the wrath of God. Since we've been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. Or even here we see it in 2 Corinthians 5, 21. He made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf that we might be the righteousness of God. You know, one pastor says it like this. On the cross, God treated Jesus as if he had lived our lives with all our sin so that God could then treat us as if we had lived Christ's life of pure holiness. Did we live that life of pure holiness? Did you live that life of pure holiness? No, no, we didn't. Christ did. And so when we look to Christ, when we trust to Christ, God sees not our sin and our shame, but he sees Christ's righteousness. When we trust in Jesus Christ and put our faith in him, God transfers to us that which Jesus Christ has earned, his holiness. And he transfers to Christ that which we have earned and none, our sin, our shame, so that God can look upon us and say, you are like my beloved son, Jesus. You know, some of you I know have re lived a relatively moral life. No doubt there are some among you who are saying, DJ, I'm not kind of this bad, sinful, sinner person that you're talking about. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm actually I'm a good person. Some might say, heck, I've been in church my whole life. I'm not like what you're talking about. Well, I've got news for you, okay? This passage, particularly verse 21, we see two categories of, of, of human, two, two categories in which you might fall. In one category, we have verse 21, he who knew no sin, Jesus, the sinless one, the perfect one, the one in whom there is no guile, no deceit, no impurity, no unholiness. He perfectly fulfilled all of God's commands. He lived his entire life 
living in the love of the Father, he never sinned, not even once. Category one. Category two, everybody else, everything else. So tell me, beloved, where are you? Category one with the sinless one with Jesus or category two, one trespass or a million? One thought, one act, one moment or a million moments. We see then that we have a great need, right? Because either we are made righteous in Jesus, the sinless one, or we are not righteous. Either our shame is taken away by Jesus Christ on the cross and rising from the dead, or our shame remains. Either our defilement is cleansed forevermore in Jesus, or we are still defiled. What do you do with the sin and the shame? Because here we see reconciliation. Here we see that God does not count against us these trespasses because he has counted them against Jesus. Therefore, we who trust in Christ are washed and cleansed, forgiven, brought back to God, reconciled. Remember, enemies become friends. If you're in Christ today, you are the friend of God. You know God and God knows you because he loves his son and you are in his son. All who trust in him will not be put to shame is the great promise that scripture speaks over you. And so do you trust in Christ today? Have you turned to him with your whole heart? If you haven't, what are you waiting for? What are you afraid of? God promised to give you eternal life and hope and joy and, and undying, unconquerable purity. He promises to give you life and to heal you and to restore you into fellowship with him to reconcile you to himself in and through Jesus Christ. Now, if you already trust him, if you already know him, then you're a disciple of Jesus Christ. And then that means our fourth point is for you because we talked about uh, reconciliation that, that God initiated and, and we were talking about the reconciliation that the world requires and needs. We talk about Jesus accomplishing it, completing it, achieving it. We also see fourthly in this passage that we who trust in Christ become ambassadors of this reconciliation. We become those through whom God makes this message known to the world. Look back at verse 18, because if you recall, if you were watching, I only read like half the verse each of these times. I kind of skipped the second half. Look back at verse 18. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself, and, and what? What did he do? And gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Verse 19, that is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and doing what? Entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. We see that those whom God saves, he gives a ministry of reconciliation and a message of reconciliation, of peace to the world. Verse 20, therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. We implore you, Paul says, we implore you, be reconciled to God. Be reconciled to God. Paul calls you, Christian, an ambassador, an ambassador for, for Jesus Christ. What's an ambassador? Now, there are three simple things, you know, simplistically we might say, three things that make you an ambassador uh, that you've been appointed or sent. There are no self-appointed ambassadors. A king or a congress, a prime minister, a president appoints and sends somebody to be his delegated authority, to be her delegated speaker. And so if you're a Christian, you're an ambassador because you've been given a delegated authority. A king has sent you out. He's appointed you. The second thing that makes you an ambassador Namely, you don't stay home. You're appointed to go somewhere else. You live in an alien land. You don't stay 
in your own country where the king or the, co- the congress is. You're sent somewhere else. And in that other place, that host country, you are representing that king. The ambassador does not stay home. The ambassador goes and speaks and represents. The, the ambassador is not to forget his home country, right? The ambassador forgets that he's from the king or the congress, then he fails to be an ambassador. You, brother and sister in Christ, are the, the delegated authoritative spokesman for God. And you are not to forget that, that you represent him. It's your identity. There's a third thing that makes you an ambassador, and that is you have a message. That which the king speaks, you speak. We as Christians, we don't get to say whatever we want, whatever we want. We, are, we represent our great God, and we see that here. We are ambassadors, God making his appeal through us. Through us. Now, I'm, I'm not aware of it. I don't think that there are any ambassadors a part of Redeemer Church or that, that people are connected to a diplomatic mission here. Right? I mean, each of you come from a, a different nation somewhere. You have a passport that comes from somewhere else. But if I ask you, say you're from the Philippines, and I ask you to comment on something that your president has said or done, it's your personal opinion, right? You're not an official delegate uh, of the nation of the Philippines. If I ask you, and you're from India, hey, give me a comment. What do you you think about uh, Prime Minister Modi? You can give me your your opinion, right? But it's not like the national, authoritative, delegated message because you're not an ambassador for your nation in that way. Beloved, you are, as a follower of Christ, you are the delegated ambassador for the Lord Jesus Christ. You have a message that God has entrusted you with, namely, that people may be reconciled to God through Jesus Christ. You have an authoritatively given message to speak that people would hear and see in your life, namely, that Jesus has made peace by the blood of his cross. And so with Paul, I say, beloved, you are an ambassador for Christ. God making his appeal through you. Through us here gathered on a Sunday morning. Through us gathered in, in week by week in community groups. Through us when we have somebody into our house and, and speak to them over a meal. Through us living out an intentional life for the glory of Jesus Christ in our, in our work or in our studies or in our relationships with people. You are the intended instrument through whom God wants the world to know about Jesus Christ. You know, it's not primarily, consider this, not primarily through like some ecstatic experience, like a dream or a vision that God desires the redemption of Jesus to be heard about. It's not through the created order. The sun and the moon and the stars, as beautiful as they are, do not tell people how they can be redeemed in Jesus Christ. But this is how the world comes to know of the redemption that is in Jesus Christ. Through you and me, faithfully speaking about his grace and his goodness and his mercy and his kindness and his gentleness. You know, we see here as well that this isn't like a special class of Christians, right? It's not like, hey, I'm a Christian and then like maybe five years or 10 years from now, then I'll like graduate to ambassador status. Those who have been reconciled are simultaneously entrusted with the ministry of reconciliation. Those who have peace with God now have this message of speaking peace. And so whether you're a tween or you're a retiree or anyone in between, you are an ambassador for Jesus Christ. Husband, wife, married, single. You represent Jesus in the world to the world so that they might hear of the peace that they can have with Jesus Christ. I want to pause for just a moment, though. This passage, as awesome as I think it is, speaking about reconciliation, doesn't actually give us a lot of detail about the day-to-day life of an ambassador. Right, the, the guy that I met that I mentioned earlier, you know, he had actually, he told me he had very long manuals uh, that, that, that detailed to him what he could and couldn't do and what he could and couldn't say to be an ambassador, like when he could, with whom he could drink chai and with whom he couldn't. 
we don't have something exactly like that, right? We don't have a detailed set of lists about what we do and don't do to be an ambassador in that way. In fact, you have a lot of freedom, Christian, as to how you represent Jesus Christ in the world. There is no magic ambassadorial key. Uh, these seven words are what you say all the time, and that's, that, that's it, you've done your job. There's no magical personality or gender. There's no magical vocation. In fact, people faithfully represent, speak about Jesus Christ as, as his ambassador in nearly every kind of vocation, from every kind of conceivable background, and they do it faithfully. My hope this morning is that you, if you're a believer, if you're a Christian, if you love the Lord Jesus Christ, to think about, consider, how can you represent, represent your King, the Lord Jesus Christ? Because first and foremost, First and foremost, you are salt and light. You belong to him. You are an ambassador for a great king. Now, I know some of you are doing this already, and you've been doing this already. And perhaps for many years, you've been a faithful ambassador in your work or in your community. You continually want to be light and salt, expressing the goodness and the glory of Jesus. You know that it's hard. You know that there are risks to be taken. And I praise God for you. You encourage my heart, you encourage my soul, and you draw, even for the whole community of believers, you, you lead us in this ambassadorial command, and I thank God for you. And the rest of us, as we're learning what it means to be an ambassador, we can look to you as an example. So today, we've seen that God the Father initiated reconciliation because the world requires it, and because Jesus Christ has accomplished it, we get to be ambassadors of it, appealing to the world. And so even today, as, as we close and as I pray, I want you to think, as you're a Christian, if you're a believer, a follower of Christ, who do you know needs to hear this message of peace? Because God has made peace for us on our behalf through Jesus Christ. Who needs to hear this message that you know of? How can you be a faithful ambassador for Jesus Christ in your work, in your community, the gym you go to, among the students that you study with? How can you be that light and salt? Pray with me now. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for sending Jesus Christ he who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might be right with you, received back, reconciled with you. Lord, we were your enemies, but now we have become your friend. We were your enemies, separated from you, and yet, Lord God, you have now made us your, like your beloved son, and I thank you and praise you for Jesus Christ, risen from the dead, exalted to the right hand of the Father, who right now draws we who are Christians, we who love you and know you to be his ambassadors to be his spokespeople in this world. Lord, I also think of those here who are on the edge, who are wondering, what does it mean to follow Jesus Christ? How can I follow him? Lord, would you send your spirit, open up their eyes, give them faith to call upon Jesus Christ so that they might be saved today. Lord, I pray these things in the glorious name of Jesus Christ. Amen.